Josh and Freaky with a couple of dumb shits. Hello, primates! You found Primus Tracks, congratulations! I am Josh. He's Frankie. Like he's got to be in the 63rd floor of Primus Tracks Towers by now. That's right. That's like right. You move Hello, up a Josh. story every single week. Nice to see you, Frankie. <laughs> Frankie's Aaron Hi, on the... patrons. <laughs> oh, patrons, hello. Uh, primates, hello. Frankie's Aaron on the side of caution. I'm Aaron on the side of Lur. I always pick Lur's side when I get to the rail, Frankie. Um, it's, a, it's a great spot, to be honest. I have really enjoyed my shows on the Lur side. Mm-hmm. No complaints. And I'm sure I've said it before. Uh, everybody runs to Lessa's side, and that makes perfect sense. And that just leaves me a wide path straight to uh, Lur's side, and I can just be right in front of his microphone. I just always make a beeline there uh, when I get a chance to be on the rail. Yes. Works out great. Yes. I Well, my first the Saturating 7 shows were on Lessa's side, uh, but... For Denver, I thought I'm gonna do Lur side. I want to see that guitar action up close. Yeah, I want to. I want to be right in front of that acoustic guitar stand. It was amazing, for sure. And on the latest tour, I wanted to see all those custom Gibsons up close, uh, as well as the double neck that he received from Alex Lifeson. So that was uh, yes, that was wondrous. Uh, so we're already off topic, sort of. I mean, we're talking about Lur, so. <laughs> We're always on topic when you talk about Lur. But you can find us on Instagram at Primus Tracks. Same with Twitter. The email address is PrimusTracksPod at gmail.com. There is a Facebook page called Primus Tracks and Patreon.com forward slash Primus Tracks. We are talking about our final, to this moment, final studio Primus Track. Sweat beads across the brow, Frankie. We're out of Primus tracks, sort of. What do we do? Start discussing the Les Claypool side projects. Hey, that sounds like a good idea. I was panicking. So, uh, and I know we've mentioned it a few times. We will rewind the clock and go back to the beginning and talk about some of the projects these guys were in before they they came together as uh, Primus. And uh, we'll talk about a lot of side projects that have to do with Les, Larry, and Tim uh, in their own incarnations. Pretty excited about that, too. But today we're going to talk about the, to this date, final Primus track. It is Aaron on the side of Caution. Before we get there, a couple of pieces uh, I want to make sure you guys know about. First of all, let's say you're not into the Patreon thing. I totally get it. There's other ways to get involved with the podcast. Uh, One is to leave a five-star review on Apple Podcast. I will read your review right here. You could also just send a five-star review via Instagram or Twitter at Primus Tracks if you so desire. In fact, I'm going to read a five-star review via Instagram from Alex DeLazio, who also recently joined the Patreon. So double salute to you, Alex. Alex says, my favorite podcast by far. Primus Tracks has become part of my Monday routine. You guys help me gain a new appreciation for Primus songs or albums that I may have overlooked in the past. For example, I had the pleasure of hearing the Desaturating 7 live at Red Rocks, May 6, 2018, and Brooklyn on Halloween 2017, and loved it, but didn't really appreciate the record as a whole until you dissected it and gave fans a new perspective. Uh Oh, Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, a couple of great. Really appreciate that. Absolutely. He continues. uh, Primus has greatly influenced my music in many different aspects. I would, and uh, I. Oh, he plays in a band. I'll plug it. I play uh, in my band, Psychedelic Waves, which is a mix of Dick Dale, Black Sabbath, and Primus. Now that sounds interesting. Cool. And he concludes with, "I don't believe in Captain Crunch, but I do love Primus tracks." (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) Thank you. Alex, that's a really uh, wonderful five-star review. Our other piece at the beginning, Frankie, is miscellaneous debris. We started a new thing with uh, Conspiranoia in which we were going to read Primate's takes, so I would get some input from our patrons and their takes on the tracks. We did it for Conspiranoia, and I'm pointing at the guy who forgot to do it for Follow the Fool. (laughs) So (laughs) I'll read a few of our Primate's takes for Follow the Fool. So the Cretan says, Follow the Fool is just... Fun, a bouncy, memorable crowd pleaser. 
Seriously, people loved it at the show I went to this year. With a hodgepodge of influences from across the Primus lexicon, it has shades of Nagahide, Antipop, Frizzle Fry, and even Claypool, Lennon, Delirium. Excuse me. That's the second episode in a row in which I burped in the middle of saying something. <laughs> uh, he says it's like some of Lur's guitar parts from Natural Joe and Mr. Know-It-All got blended with the thwomping, mm-hmm. splashy, envelope-filtered bass lines from across the Claypool mm-hmm. spectrum. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, he's making some interesting references, huh? <laughs> Uh, surprisingly, the first that come to mind are Filipino Ray and Toadie Man's Hour, though the song could fit just as well in Green Nagahide. Imagine how J-Ski can make it even bouncier. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, yes. Our pal Porter. I really like this comment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Porter. Hi, Porter. <laughs> hi, Porter. Both tracks. He says, follow the fool and Aaron the side of caution are great tracks for when you want the conspiranoia feel, but don't like 11 minute songs. <laughs> 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 Thank you, primates, for those takes. We'll have more uh, for Aaron on the side of caution. So Porter start- is like the, the poster child for the youth in the Primus world. That's right. We've got a lot of young fans, and it's really cool to hear from them. Younger than Frankie, even, who just got his driver's <laughs> permit. Congratulations. <Frank. laughs> you can join the fun, too. Patreon.com forward slash Primus Tracks. Let's talk about Aaron on the side of caution. We have uh, credited music to Larry Lalonde. Lyrics, of course, to Les Claypool. This one checks in at 4 minutes, 33 seconds. It is the third and final track on Conspiranoid, the 2022 EP. I, I hesitate to use the word history because it's only been uh, performed over the last few months, but I'm sure you have some numbers, Frankie. Yes, it certainly was not performed as much as Fool or Conspiranoia, of course. Um, the thing about this track is that because of the bass it was recorded on, it's got to be paired with specific tracks during the set. So you will see a tendency throughout the set list where Erin got performed after Professor Not Butter or after Del Davis Tree Farm or after um, Old Diamondback Sturgeon. No? So, right. I mean, it works. It flows better that way instead of switching bases frequently, right? Right. If you're going to get the fretted six, you're going to get one hopes exactly. two to three tunes exactly. out of it. Yeah. Um, At only six performances in total so far, um, I wouldn't hesitate to label Erin a rarity, taking into consideration that the other two songs got performed a lot more frequently. So yeah. whether it comes down to the instrumentation, the choice of bass, or the difficulty in performing the track, which I guess we could cover later. Um, it could be anyone's guess, but it did come late into the tour. I don't know if you recall that we were wondering when this one was going to be performed. And it was finally premiered in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Very interesting track. And of course, its life history is a reflection of that. If I recall correctly, Conspiranoia was performed on every single Tribute to Kings date, so yes. 52 times or so, Yes, 34 for Follow the Fool, and only six for Aaron. That is a it's crazy, number. right? Yeah. I, I was lucky enough to get one of those six uh, in oh, Reading. Oh, jelly. When they, <laughs> when they opened the show <laughs> with a with a three-track run on the fretted six of uh, Nut Butter, Aaron, and uh, Old Diamondback Sturgeon. Once again, that's insane. Yeah, old Diamondback on the fretted six was a surprise. I'm still not over that three song run to open the show. It just blew me away. Uh, one of six, and it sounds great. Uh, and we do have a live cut later from one of the six performances as well. I think too. Yeah, we were speculating, thinking, okay, Conspiranoia every night, and then it didn't take them long to start to find a place for Follow the Fool, as we discussed as the first encore track. You were there. You were there. So you can attest. Um, I believe Erin is fairly similar to the album version when it gets performed live, right? It is. Uh, I'm going to play a certain portion where Les does a little something different uh, with his mini solo um, on the high end there. But most of the, most of it is straightforward. Yeah. And it's but it sounded great. It fit right in with those other fretted six tracks. And I was I was beaming ear to ear. So I would love for more than six performances of this track. Actually, there's a lot of tracks I would love more than six performances of, being honest. So <laughs> this one goes in that basket. Uh, what I recall about this track, Frankie, is Lur said in an interview that he was halfway home. He was driving home from the Bay Area to L.A., which is a long drive. And he recounted that uh, they had recorded Conspiranoia. He was driving home. He got a call from Les. 
And Les said, hey, I want to do a couple more. Do you have one? And Larry said, yeah. And he turned around and drove back to the Bay Area <laughs> a few hundred miles uh, so that he could lay down uh, lay down a couple more tracks. And so this one uh, came from Larry. I imagine it started with the harmonic uh, part that we hear, but also the, the heavier riff. So I think Larry brought those and they built the track out from there. And as you mentioned, it is the glorious return of the fretted six. Now, I... Can't recall the last time we heard the Carl Thompson fretted six uh, on a Primus record, but I think it on had a been. Primus record, yeah. um, Antipop, perhaps. Okay, wow. Or maybe Brown album. Holy Brown crap. album for sure. Okay, uh, yeah, it was on. It was on Antipop for sure. Uh, okay, so that it's been a while. Yeah, uh, the Mama track, possibly something else that is slipping my mind. That long on a Primus track, but we know, or a Primus record, but we know that it also surfaced uh, here and there in side projects, most notably Bernie Brains, correct? Yes. Okay. Bucket of Bernie Brains, as Keio mentioned, have a hodgepodge of bass guitars yeah. in his recording. So this one had been sitting around for a while, hopefully not gathering dust, because it's a beautiful piece of uh, art. <laughs> so it's, just... it's like the triumphant return of the rainbow bass for Desaturating 7. It came yeah. out of nowhere, right? I mean, yeah, absolutely. Who, was, who was expecting the fretted six to yeah. appear on a primal track again no one <laughs> it's like that took us blind- completely by surprise it's like yeah. that blinding light that uh marion pippin see and who emerges from it <laughs> but gandalf <laughs> the white <laughs> and that is that is precisely an aspect i want to point out about the track i mean it's an amazing song in and on itself but i would venture to say that one of the reasons well it is my favorite song on the EP. Mm-hmm. I, I really love this track. It's the one I have played the most out of all three. And I think one of the reasons I love it so much is the nostalgia factor. It sounds like something out of Punchbowl. I don't know if it's uh, the cadence of the track, the rhythm, uh, if it's the fact that it's the classic lineup, if it's the, the fretted six, but I mean, it just harks back to old school Primus so much that it fills me with nostalgia every time I listen to it. I think I'm there with you. Uh, in my notes, I wrote it's very brown in the vocals and with the fretted six. Uh, but we know the fretted six was common on punch pull as well. So uh, I pointed to the dynamics and the heaviness, especially of the sound uh, that made me think of punch pull. So it really is to me, it's a throwback track, but it also uh, introduces some new wrinkles into the Primus fabric. Uh, there's there's some things going on that they don't normally do, but I would say it's probably my favorite of the three as well. I think the live performance cemented it for me. It was it was tight uh, and it was spirited. So let's start there. Uh, we know it started with uh, some Larry parts. So we have harmonic no- I'm calling it harmonic noodling, but I know that it's not just noodling. There's some kind of uh, reason to it here. <laughs> I forgot it takes him so long to come in. So that's where things start off. I think it started with that uh, with that harmonic lick. And, uh, you know, I play a little bit of guitar, and I'm not very good by my own admission. Playing harmonics is difficult to get them just right. They are finicky uh, because you are not yes. actually pressing down on the strings all the way uh, to yes. the neck of the guitar. You're you're trying to create that sound over the actual fret, um, and it has to do with uh, you know the sound waves hitting the metal and whatnot. It's tough. So uh, I even hear smatterings through where Lur isn't hitting it perfectly, and. I, you know, I think that's part of the Lur aesthetic anyway, so I'm not bothered by it because I know it's difficult. And he does it for a majority of the track, so uh, there's a few minutes uh, throughout this track where he's just doing that pattern, and it's tough. He also brings this uh, this heavier lick with him uh, that I think really suits the band well, and I think it's a bit of a departure uh, because you don't normally get these... Uh, heavier guitar parts you do here and there, uh, especially not since the Frizzle Fry days. Uh, you get uh, a little more understated guitar. Yes. But I'm a real big fan of this lick, and it's got a pretty cool turnaround uh, at the very end of each phrasing. <laughs> So 
So we get four iterations with the last note headed downwards on the uh, on the musical scale, and then we get a couple of turnarounds where he ends by going uh, up a step or two to to hit a higher note, and that's pretty cool. So that's uh, this is a nice little variation. A number of times too, and I'm I'm trying to save the last twenty seconds for the end because I want it all to come together. Now I know Frankie, you're sitting there going, "Go to the end, go to the end, go to the end." It's the payoff. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there, buddy. He also does a cool thing where he lets some of the notes ring during the verses, and uh, so he's he's doing that harmonic thing, but then he does one of his trademark hits a note and volume swells it, so you hear the, uh, and then he's back to the. To the harmonic, and I love uh, when he does that. He does that a lot on uh, a lot of our Caesar Cheese tracks, I recall. So he's yes. bringing us back can to I, that idea. Can I point out something about the drums? Let's talk drums. All right, listening to the track on headphones, I know that it starts off with the drums. And the first thing that my mind did was a parallel. I was thinking about my friend Fats. How loose the drums are in that intro right and in this case i was thinking wow this is i mean this is kind of new territory for for her right doing something kind of more intricate with the hi-hat something Mm -hmm. more understated with the snare i mean that combination is like something that jay lane would have played on the track i'm surprised tim came up with that intro i think it it talks a lot about his versatility as a musician. Yeah, I think he patterned it after what Larry was doing with the harmonics, and so he's he's stretching himself and not uh, and not doing the uh, that straightforward uh, what we would you know expect to get say from a Tim, Tim Alexander drum lick. And so it's fantastic. And it's fantastic. Yeah, and it does kind of have more of a a swing or a swagger to it, which is a word I hate saying, but I think it works here. Uh, it's just got that hip action, <laughs> for lack of a better term, that a lot of Tim's work doesn't necessarily have uh, because that's his voicing. It's very danceable. I'm sorry for those of you that are watching me sway my hips. <laughs> so it's vi- it's a very different approach for Tim, yeah. And it's... Um, so his his dynamic with what Larry's doing and then what Les is doing, it's very different. And there's there's all these different things happening, like all these. You know, I, I'm looking at my cover art image here with the with the gears and uh, the ball going through the tubes and the guy looking through the magnifying glass. There's all these different uh, gears spinning and pieces moving, and it it makes for quite a busy uh, verse and main lick. <laughs> Uh, before you get to the heavy part where we get in, more into unison, which, as we've said over the course of these episodes, especially with Matt last week, what a great payoff that is, because it's a rare treat. Uh, so they're giving us uh, kind of the best of both worlds there. Um, I want to point to that. First of all, that drum pattern is is really cool. And I don't it doesn't sound like it's for beginners. You know, I think you have to get dialed in before you can do something cool like that. Of course, Tim can do it in his sleep and. It's uh, it sounds great, and it leaves some space too because uh, after that second uh, snare hit on the four, there's a little bit of space. Uh, and as we know, uh, Les likes to do that with his bass licks, but um, Larry is pretty constantly cycling through the harmonics. So once again, they're not, they're kind of off kilter here and there, um, from a from a sound perspective, and that's good. We want that. You know, I want my ears to be going in different directions. I really like when they come together uh, after the the heavy lick. I talk about the gox sometimes. I just I just love snare gox. It doesn't matter whose they are. Tim's are fun. Hmm. Here we go. Gok, 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 gok. I think if I had actually picked up a you know the snare drum or something. Or, or taking lessons, I think I really would have liked it, Frankie. I think I want to buy a practice pad and, and some mm-hmm. sticks and uh, just go wild. Thanks, Tim, for the inspiration. And then, of course, we get this really cool uh, Tom run uh, through the heavy part. He's playing it pretty straight, but then he also gives us these uh, these neat little Tom runs uh, in the heavy part. <laughs> Wait, 
What I really like about that, um, Frankie, I'm sure you were listening on headphones too, it runs right through your left channel. So it kind of yes. starts at the back of your head and comes around. So that's some really nice mixing by Les there too. Uh, let's is, there, talk- uh, is there a particular song in the Primus or Claypool? I mean, we talked about the sound, mm-hmm. but is there any particular track this song reminds you of? Well, I was going to go there with the bass part. The low end that Les is doing, I call it the rest and bones part. That's where my mind goes. I, I don't think, I, th- I think sound wise, even though the Brown album is so blown out, that's where I go. It's a strange comparison, but it works in my head. Uh, no, I, I mean, I was circling around it the last few mm-hmm. days. And despite the song harking back to old school Primus, I think at the same time, it's completely new. Yeah. I can't quite connect it to anything else. Especially because, like we mentioned previously, the vocal phrasing is so strange. Yes, absolutely. Those are those new wrinkles. So we have this uh, strange uh, harmonic part. We've got uh, the fretted six, and there's some really cool reverse delay happening on a loop uh, throughout this track from the fretted six. Uh, We have this really nice heavy part that reminds us of uh, previous uh, years of Primus, but doesn't tread the same ground. It's a it's a new product, and that's what's really exciting. It's uh, it it makes me feel like, hey, they still have gas in the tank, they still have these creative ideas. I'm looking forward to more work from them because I think they can take us in another direction that we haven't heard from them before. It's not my dog doing the same old tricks when when company comes over and they go, yeah, yeah, we've seen that before. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna teach that old dog new tricks. Uh, I do want to talk about that fretted six because it sounds. I've said it before, you can pick that out of a lineup of 96 other basses. I'll know it every single time, that fretted six. It just has that sound, that frequency. Uh, so I'll point to what I see as the rest and bones part uh, when he goes really low end and and a couple other things that tickled me throughout this track here. Tell me if you hear it too, Frankie. <laughs> So just that that strumming on that low that low string, and letting the the space and the drums do their thing, uh, that's just very rest and bones, you know, yes. going minimal. But then he's coming up on the neck and giving us a lot of uh, uh, high frequency noodling, which is really fun, um, and hitting those notes uh, here and there. Uh, he also gives us a really nice uh, treat at uh, about two minutes and twenty five seconds with this uh, reverse delay action and uh, a mini solo in here too Rad. cool that sounded like it was a lot of fun to make. And this this track in particular, I think, I mean, all three, it sounds like they're having a blast. But this one, um, there's a lot of extra little things in it. So I think they're having fun with it. Uh, the last thing I'll point to is the the heavy part. Uh, the, we get uh, one of the repetitions of the heavy part. Just hearing what Les is doing, wh- which is ostensibly a unison riff with Lur. Uh, but he's letting some parts breathe. And some parts he's giving embellishments. But he's really digging into that low end, too. (laughs) I'm loving that variation that he's doing. So he's hitting it on the higher frequencies, but every once in a while he's he's keeping it low um, and hitting the same notes just octaves lower. But also, he's, there's even more variation than that. So, uh, I'm actually I want to listen to those as many of those six live recordings as I can to to hear how much is that of that is being replicated, how much of that seems improvised. It is, and I mentioned it before. It's that pattern is you. He does something concrete uh, in the first couple of beats and leaves the the second part open, uh, whether it's improvisations or noise or to embellish what he's already done. And I'm, I think I'm hearing that here, and I also hear it in the le- in the uh, in the vocals, which we'll we'll get to. So those are the those are the little things that tickled me about this track, and they all add up to something great for me. There's actually one more thing here. Uh, it goes into a transition, and I I like how disjointed this sounds, 
And I'm pretty sure it was by design. I don't think Les was a, an eighth note early. But listen to when he, he strikes one of these high notes and then Tim does a couple extra hits to signal a transition here to the heavy part. I love that. Da-na-na. And then Herb just gives us a couple of hits, but <laughs> Les gives us the, uh, the uh, three strike strum. Da-da-da. I love it. That sounds really cool. Also, the lookout from Les is ear candy for me. <laughs> Hmm. Uh, his vocal tracks on this one are a pleasure to listen to. Um, <laughs> I, it, and it makes me think if he recorded, uh, an album of, uh, you know, it's 45 minutes of him clearing his throat, I would probably buy it, you know, cause he's making all these noise. Look out or how, you know, and doing that sort of thing. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. Huh, heh, how it, that sort of thing. There's a lot of it going on. Go ahead, Les. Just hack into a microphone. I was thinking about Punchbowl. You were thinking about Brown Album. My parallel, I I would like to think, is not obvious because of the similarity in the song titles. Caution should be used while operating. (laughs) I mean, in terms of sound, in terms of atmosphere, do you think this track would feel at home in the Riddles album? I don't think I would put it in there. Just because so it's the, more primus, it's more primus even Claypool side project. It, well, it's it, and it's different guys. It's a different lineup. It doesn't have the same resonance. It just doesn't have the same vibe. I don't think I would put it in there. Uh, I would love to just to pair those two songs together because they both have the same word in the title and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Transpose one over another or something. Uh, those vocals, as you said, they are ear candy, and uh, I really like listening to the vocal tracks on this one because we get those those higher registers that come in for the air and on the side of caution. Um, I'm just getting over a cold, so I don't think I can get that high today. <laughs> but we also get less with attitude, you know. Oh, uh-huh, uh-huh. he's getting down there and he's digging into it. Huh. I, I don't know. I like it when Les kind of goes tough guy, big, strong redneck sound, something like that, <laughs> <laughs> if that makes sense. Uh, when he kind of digs into that, you know, he does it with tweakers and he does it with a lot of tracks. It just sounded like he had a bl- had a blast with this one, <laughs> making all these goofy sounds. These are some interesting lyrics, Frankie. And I just said yes. the the, uh, the patterns are unusual, and uh, they are hard to follow on the first few listens. I had to to listen to tune my ear uh, to hear what was going on. This does have an intriguing couplet structure. It looks like in the first line of each couplet, Frankie, we get four syllables. So I'm looking at uh, just. The first verse, uh, you think you can wiggle through a minefield. Well, he'll be damned if he's going to step on a plandam appeal, which is a term I'll talk about in a second. Uh, He's well inclined to thumb a buggy squashing, but never mind about Aaron on the side of caution. Four syllables each of those first lines. And then the rest of those second lines are seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve syllables. So he gets to... As I said, in the first phrasing, it's four syllables every time, much like his bass lines. And then the second phrasing, he gets to play around with the different number of syllables. And he's got the space to do it, uh, too. So there's, that's a, that's a nice artistic endeavor he's put himself on to use his, uh, vocals or vocal lines or lyrical lines in, in a way that he uses his bass lines sometime. Other than the structure itself, you know, he does bring that attitude to the vocals, but he also does it to the lyrics. And uh, once again, as with the other two tracks on this EP, I think the message is quite clear. Uh, there's <laughs> this, it's three tracks of airing his frustrations and just <laughs> saying, I'm sick of this shit. <laughs> to, you know, I've been sitting around for a year, a uh, year and a half, two years. I want this to be over. These people are perpetuating it in my mind. That, and this is me paraphrasing what I, what I read from it or inferring what I read from it. So some highlights for me, of course, the pun in the title, Aaron on the side of caution, it's spelled E-R-I-N as in uh, the name of a person or Aaron Gobra if you're Irish. That that first couplet, you think you can wiggle through a minefield. I Anytime I think of a minefield, Frankie, I think of the Merv record title, Dancing Naked in a Minefield, because that <laughs> cover art, it's just seared in my skull. I can't not see it. I've I've tried. I've tried to get rid of it. It's disturbing. In that second couplet, we get, uh, well, he'll be damned if he's going to step on a planned damn appeal, or planned dem appeal, depends on how you pronounce it. It's a stretch. We'll say that. Frankie, I don't know if you heard the term 
clandemic uh, from the skeptics during the COVID. Oh yes, times that everything was a, a huge conspiracy, and it was all thought out, right? Right. So a lot of people called that the plandemic. So it was planned by some shadowy figures in the government for some kind of nefarious purposes. Actually, you know, it became mainstream a lot of those ideas. But the idea then is the plandemic. Uh, is a banana peel, so this person's not going to get tricked by it or slip up on it. Like I said, plandam appeal, it's it's a stretch, but it works, I suppose, close enough to banana peel. The old cartoony slipping on the banana peel idea. Um, the next one uh, is, he uses the term conspiranoid in this track, in these lyrics, so there's your uh, EP title, yes. of course. One thing I find very curious is that um, yes, of course, the three tracks are connected thematically right however what i find very interesting is that in the past this kind of advice you know of erring on the side of caution would be something that Les would advise to other people but i don't think it's something he would have been concerned about himself mm -hmm. a proof of that are several lyrics that he has written over the years but after you know, hearing how Cage told him to maybe tone down some of the lyrics, the, the preachy aspect of the lyrics in Conspiranoia, uh, it makes you wonder if he's singing about himself as well. That maybe nowadays he has to be more careful about what he writes or what he conveys in his songs. Do you think that's possible? Well, I think that's uh, part and parcel to experience. Uh, this is an older guy. He's got a lot, this happens with a lot of people. Once they, once they have kids, their outlook on life changes and their priorities change. And sometimes their attitudes toward a lot of different things will change. And I, and this is a guy, his kids are grown, but he has a lot of worldly experience at this point. You know, I think of the lyric of, uh, Long in the Tooth where he says, I, I sold off my rebellion for a pocket full of couth. And I, I hear that in this too. It's, uh, how about you, you know, how about you think about the consequences first, which is your prefrontal cortex right here behind your, your, your skull in the front <laughs> of your head, right? Your forehead. For those of you who are, uh, of course, I'm a sixth grade teacher, so I get to tell kids this all the time. I say, this part of your brain, uh, boys and girls, but mostly boys, listen, this part of your brain doesn't actually develop in most of you until you're 21. And some of you till you're 25. So mo you have no concept of the short and or long-term consequences of your actions, which is why you're making the horrible decisions you are right now. But it's not an excuse, <laughs> right? Because you can grow it <laughs> with life experience and with the development of that part of your brain, you can uh, see the long-term and you can understand, you know, self-preservation a whole lot more effectively. And I think that's kind of the... The message here is just do – just do, and it's in the last verse. It's do these things. You might actually survive this and we can all go back to our lives. You know. And I think I'm inserting some of that commentary, but that's the message I get. So I, I totally forgot your question, but I think I addressed it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, you did. I skipped the, the couplet uh, with panties down because, of course, I was thinking of Renegade and I, you know – Reach on, shank them panties down. Come here, boy. And then I was also thinking about that uh, sample – uh, that Tom Morello brought to Power Mad. <laughs> Strap up on them panties. We also have uh, that conspiranoid making savage, cynical, yes. loud, and proud. And really great pair of words, savage, cynical. I love the consonants there of savage, cynical. And then the rhyme of loud and proud, that internal rhyme, uh, refers to the idea that the, the president at the time emboldened uh, far-right groups and uh, fringe groups – uh, many of which were classified as hate groups to to go public and speak out and and just go actively recruit people uh, and intimidate other groups of people. So ninety nine point nine percent sure that's what that is referencing uh, in a in a bit of a veiled way, but thinly veiled. I'm not sure and what, what is the what is the rabbit hole of Macintosh. I'm very curious about that. Oh, I'm going to get to that one because that's a stretch too. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. I'm going in order, but there's there's this other couplet, uh, Frankie, uh, a bag of beans only meant for cornhole tossing. Now I know what cornhole is, and you've probably seen it too. It's those those angled boards, you know, roughly a 45 degree angle, and you have your your cloth filled with beans, bean bags, and you're 
tossing them over there trying to get them in the hole. And of course, there's of course there's professional cornhole leagues now and people win thousands of dollars for being able to throw a thing through a hole, which I mean, that's kind of the point of basketball, kind of the point of hockey, kind of the point of a lot of sports. So why not give us hope, those of us that aren't super fast and super tall? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I can, I can throw that through the hole. Uh, I'm not sure what that means, though, but – when we get down to the last verse, like I said, this is the advice portion of things. Inoculate, cover your face with a rag. Those are pretty clear. He wants to keep that four-syllable pattern going. So inoculate, cover your face with a rag, procrastinate, sell another couple of body bags. So what he's saying is if you don't get your shot or you don't wear your mask, you might end up dead. And then this, oh, wash your mind from the rabbit hole of Macintosh, it <laughs> cracks me up. <laughs> uh, it's a dated reference. You know, people – at the Macintosh was a computer by Apple. I assume what he's talking about is wash your mind from the rabbit holes you're going down on the internet that would tell you otherwise or take you away from common sense of of this pandemic. But he uses the term Macintosh because it rhymes with caution. <laughs> you know, he doesn't say iphone in. He doesn't say pc in <laughs> or microsoft in. He could have said microsoft and that could have worked too. I don't know. Maybe that was in a draft. Uh, but that's that's the reference there. But no, but I don't think anybody's called it a Mac in how many years? Do they still make Macs? Power Macs? I don't know. I did play my Tales from the Punch Bowl and hand CD on a Mac. <laughs> Recently? Did it work? <laughs> no. Oh. No, that was a decade ago. I was going to say, if you still have that machine that can play it, I will buy it from you right now because my <laughs> uh, I don't have a machine that can play my enhanced CD anymore. And I'm still very sad about it. You know, he says... At the very end, be responsible. Try erring on the side of caution. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, if you were erring on the side of caution, it'd be E R R I N G. So there's the pun with the name Aaron, or just the way a lot of people would say it by kind of apostrophizing the G and not pronouncing it. So pretty cool stuff there, and it it is. This is one of his more uh, unusual lyrical deliveries. And once again, he's you know he's got some more tricks up his sleeve. So I'm I'm game to hear them. I really, really enjoy this track all the way around. And I think it's, uh, you know, if we were going to do our one to a hundred or however many Primus Studio tracks there are and rank them from our, our absolute favorite to our absolute least favorite. Well, I know what my least favorite is, but I don't know what my number one is, but I'm thinking Aaron's pretty high up on the list. Absolutely. All right, Frankie, your homework is to rank every single Primus track from one to the bottom and, <laughs> and reveal them <laughs> in reverse order. <laughs> One episode at a time until we get to number one. Let's look at a live cut. This one is from Winnipeg, Manitoba, June 4, 2022 at the Burton Cummings Amphitheater. Our and, treasured recording. Uh, we're going to hear uh, part of the heavy part, Frankie, but also part of the mini bass solo. And Brilliant. The, the rad. There are just some rad effects on it. It sounds really good. Um, when I first listened to it, I thought it was synth. You tell me. That one sounds really good. And the, those hammer-ons and pull-offs that he's doing, you know, sound pretty exotic. Johnny G might say Mixolydian. I forget which mode he says Primus does a lot of stuff in, but Phrygian maybe. So it's, it has that exotic sound to it. Once again, this is uh, this recording sounds fantastic. And you get, hopefully, you're hearing the heaviness and that just fits right in um, when they're playing those six-string bass tracks. And for your reference, Frankie, Aaron on the side of Caution was paired with Professor Nut Butter. Uh, for uh, this performance, and it was those were the two fretted six tracks before the end of the first set. Right on, you said it. Often paired with nut butter. Let's look at some of our primates takes for Aaron on the side of caution. Let's hear from the Cretan again. Why not? Uh, he says, "I'll say this about Aaron: perhaps a top five Primus song since the modern Primus era, 2010 through uh, present, and certainly and shamelessly my current most played song in my music library for this year. I suspect Frankie might be able to claim the same thing. Is he right? Definitely. 
winner. It's been on constant rotation since it came out. Oh, you two guys have to go get lunch sometime. You're basically the same person. Uh, he sa- <laughs> <laughs> and he's buying. Uh, he says, how can I even describe this song other than deliriously creepy with a tinge of acid hillbilly? And I think that comes from the vocals. I think I might have pointed to that. The fretted six is resurrected in its full glory with a crunchy, fiendish bass line that's accentuated by Lur's hypnotic ambulance sirens. Herb the Ginseng Drummer is fu- is in full Silverback Gorilla mode playing like it's a freaking punch bowl song. Am I crazy? Or could this be described as what a modern sausage sound like song might sound like? Yeah, I don't know about sausage. But the commentary uh, prior to that, I think I'm on board with you. Nice vocabulary choices, too. John the Fish says, been a Primus fan for over 30 years, and Aaron sounds like old school Primus, and he threw up the horns, and he says, got it on repeat. Johnny Perona says, speaking of groove, how about the haunting nature of Aaron? This is Lur's best accredited Primus track with Ho in a close second. I was blown away by his precision when I caught this track live in Milwaukee. Hey, good on you, Johnny. Not sure who else is a musician, but hitting those harmonics perfectly over the course of a five-minute tune is insanely difficult. Not surprised that Lur was able to pull it off. Les's vocal delivery in this song is sinister and fits the mood of the track so perfectly. Oh yeah, and it's the return of the fretted six. He hit it on all the same points. This dude's gunning for our jobs, Frankie. (laughs) Thank you, Johnny. So once again, uh, our primates takes come from patreon.com forward slash primus tracks. Go check it out. Share your takes there. I'm happy to read them here. I do have one more because I wanted to credit uh, Anthony Delpreet, who said the reason Aaron is such a perfect song is because it is the primus Pollock. I love this term. He says smatterings of the best of what primus is goes into this track. That's why it sounds like the Naga Brown Frizzle Mix. They definitely brought the Primus out of each other for this one and hail to the Fretted Six. I think the Fretted Six has a lot of fans. (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) I'll take an all-Fretted Six album, please. Thanks, everybody. We've we've made it. We're at the end of uh, all of our Primus studio tracks. I know we skipped some covers. Before you primates start yelling at us, we'll probably get to them. But as far as original studio Primus tracks, we're out. So I should probably say this. Unbelievable. It is unbelievable. (laughs) Aaron on the side of caution should be used when operating heavy machinery. Because you've been tracked. (laughs) Next time, Frankie. Midday aerobic jog through streets not well lit by lamplight. Oh, he's taking us straight to sausage. Wow. (laughs) We might take a detour before we get there, but... I'm really oh, looking okay. forward I to pulling. The I'm I'm <laughs> really looking forward to getting some sausage off the barbecue, though. You know who wants to talk about sausage? Soy is coming. <laughs> I'll leave you at that. <laughs> Our good pal. At Primus Tracks on Instagram and Twitter, Facebook page. Go visit Frankie. He gets lonely sometimes <laughs> when he's not talking about Bowie. <laughs> <laughs> Later days. Willie Mays. <laughs> <laughs>